This week I got some results back for a life insurance policy, and uh, my cholesterol is a little high. Not a shocker. I eat a lot of bacon. But I told my wife, I said, hey, babe, almost up to a million bucks if you kill me. And without missing a heartbeat, my middle son says, Jackson, did you hear that? If daddy dies, we get a Nintendo Switch. <laughs> We're talking about anger today. That's what fueled up in me. I was going to teach him. Uh, this morning's passage is interesting. Before we read it, I'm just going to let you know that the majority of religions will teach principles very similar to those in this morning's passage. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25, where we're going to begin reading, there are some very practical things that no matter which religious worldview, generally, you're going to have most of these things in there. Don't steal. Be kind. Sticks and stones. That sort of stuff. So we're going to read it. And as I was preparing for this, I thought, okay, we could either break this into its own 12-week sermon series, but I figured you wouldn't want that. So I said, Lord, where do you want me to zoom in so that we can learn how to deal with sin according to the good news of Jesus? And I wanted him to pick anything except for anger. I said, God, let me, let me preach on using our words, not sharp words that tear down, but kind words that build up. And my prayer life, it was, no, anger. And I said, God, how about forgiveness? That's a good church thing. And he said, no, anger. I said, Lord, how about kindness, tenderness, anything except for anger, stealing, lying, all this stuff? No, use anger. So I'm using anger, and it will become apparent why, because I needed this sermon. So no matter who is here or not here, it doesn't matter. This is a sermon that has come out to myself in my car. This is the sermon that I need to preach to myself today. This is a sermon that I needed this whole year, 2017. So I'm going to pray, we're going to read, and may the Lord help us all. Father, break through my hard heart and give me freedom from anger and bitterness. Lord, break through hearts today in this room that are harboring anger, break through and clean us from the inside out, from the things that cause us to lash out. Lord, restore those in here who have been broken and shattered by anger and rage. Redeem those who have been purchased by bitterness. Help us to cling to you. And Lord, I pray that today would be the farthest thing from, from just an anger management class. I pray that we would not see sin through that lens, that we would find power beyond the breathing techniques and beyond the relaxation techniques. Lord, show up in this place and give people tangible, touchable, tasteable freedom from this, from this sin that plagues so many people. In Jesus' name, amen. Ephesians 4, I'm starting in verse 25, which I usually don't like to do because it starts with the verse, therefore, which every time you see that in the Bible, you need to ask, why is, what is that there for? And essentially, Paul has said, you are new. You have a new self to put on. Get dressed in the new self. And now he's going to tell us what the new self in Jesus looks like. Therefore, having put away falsehood, lying, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Pay attention to this next verse. It's going to be our key verse for the morning. Be angry. Everyone say, be angry. Be angry. And do not sin. That's the tricky part. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as it fits the occasion. I wanted to preach on that verse. That it may give grace to those who hear. Verse 30, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. I wanted to preach on this verse. By whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God and Christ forgave you. 
There are so many verses. So little time. If I had a church of nerds, um, like if we were like right next to a Bible college and all these people were eager overachievers to get an A-, minus, I would just stay here for 12 weeks. But we're at a church of real human beings. People that go to seminary, they're not real human beings. They've gone to school and they become weird in those little bubbles called seminary. So what we are going to do today is look at one of these. We're gonna, we're gonna, I'm going to skim through a lot of them, but I want us to zoom in on anger, but here's what I want you to do. If anger is not your thing, if by some miracle of God you have not had anger in your life, um, or you don't have an angry person near you, don't have kids because you'll probably produce an angry one, but if by some miracle this is not you, the principles of dealing with anger. I want you to look at and analyze, and I'm going to show you how to do that. So you might be the thief. You might be the gossip. If that's your primary thing, what I want us to do today is step back and see that generally humans, we go black-white with things, and especially anger. But there's a third way to deal with this, and we're going to look at this today. So first, you have to understand that the therefore is because if your faith is in Christ, you have a new being. Last week, I I took off my button up and I said, old self, new self. If you go back to the old self, if you're like, oh, this was an old garment to wear, but I want to wear it because it makes me feel good. It makes me feel safe. It makes me feel significant. So we constantly go back and we put on the old self. Now, my wife asked me today, she said, are you going to do that thing again where you take off your shirt? And I was like, I don't think so because I wore an undershirt. And she goes, oh, dang it, you know, you know why been working out. No, I'm just playing. But, but we have this thing. We have to know that now this is for those who are in Christ, those who believe in Jesus, those who say, God, I can't make it on my own. You died the death I should have died. You rose again conquering death because I could not do it, but I deserved it. If that's you, this is your new self. If you are outside of Christianity, still just peeking in saying, what are these crazy people about? This is what we're about, but you need to hear this. Every other religion in the world is going to say these things. Don't steal. It's not good. It's not good to steal. You're not going to find very many religions that are like, here are our core values. Go to your neighbor's house at midnight and pillage them. You're not going to find very many religions that are saying, here's our values. When somebody cuts in, what we do is we just use our words to stab them. They come in and you just say every negative thing about them. I mean, sometimes that feels like Christianity, but that's because I'm a pastor, I guess. Are, are you going to be able to see the difference today? This is my question I was asking God. God, how can people that don't know you, how can they see the difference that this, what I'm preaching today, is not just the religious do's and don'ts? I'm a big fan of them. When, <coughs> when I ra- railed against Game of Thrones a couple weeks ago, I mean, you should just see people roll their eyes at me. Like, Pastor, I thought you were the grace guy, but you don't watch Game of Thrones? No. There's just one human being that God told me that I should look at that way. And it's not Carl Drago. That was a test to see who was sinning. <laughs> you guys are holy. Okay. Because now we get to this, this sin, and I'm going to use anger as the example. Now, here's what I've got to say. I've got this whole intro, and it just doesn't work. Um, here's what I just need to get out. 2017, for me. You guys have probably had great, fabulous 2017s. I'm sure one of you won the lottery and tithed on it. Thank you. Um, For me, 2017 has been the most angry that I've been in the last 18 years combined. So if I took just this year, we're only in the eighth month, school hasn't even begun yet, and if I tallied or if I could measure my anger in a beaker, it would be more in this year alone than the last 17 years, just because of circumstances that have happened around me and I've let them influence me. Which is why when I read this, I said, God, anything but this verse. And I could not get away from it. I I don't want to think about anger because this has been a failure for me. It's like imagine whatever you are the worst at, at your job, and then God says, go teach people about that. That's this morning for me. Because here's the thing. The verse is simple. So when you read the Bible, read it slow. Be angry. Some of us 
I've been in church far too long. <laughs> We've forgotten that it's okay to be angry. It's, it's not a sin to be angry. Although I've not met many people that do this verse. Because here's, here's how this verse has been used against me. Someone gets angry and they spew things and they say, well, this is a righteous anger. Because as Christians, that's the only good kind of anger. And they'll say, Jesus flipped tables. Jesus got mad at Pharisees. And they, they say, look, I'm, I'm being angry, but I'm not sinning. To which I usually reply, I think you're just being angry and sinning. And then you're putting a veneer of scripture on it to feel better. Take the veneer off, run to Jesus, and let it be. Because for me, I had to realize this past two weeks that I've been angry. I've been angry at others, and I have sinned. I've harbored anger. anger. I've, it's turned from the seed of anger into the, the branches of bitterness. And here's what's crazy about this passage. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. For me, I'd have to book like a world flight and just try to race the sun. And then it says the craziest thing. Give no opportunity to the devil. Which if you've worked in like a company, that's like some HR lingo. Oh, we've got a great opportunity for you. Or if you have friends or maybe you are one of the people in like one of those things where they sell health shakes or body wraps or whatever and they get all their friends in. Hey, I've got a wonderful opportunity for you. Paul is saying, hey, you want to sit down and have a business meeting with the evil being of the universe? Let anger sit inside of you. And then you're sitting down and saying, hey, Satan, the accuser, the deceiver, I've got a great opportunity for you. Come on in. We do it. Now here's, as I was reading, I mean, anger, it's in all of us. And if you don't understand how anger works, here's what happens. Somebody cuts you off. There's a part of your brain, the amygdala, it starts to release things when somebody cuts you off or when your spouse pushes your buttons. You know, my joke is when you first get married, your spouse gets one button to push, right? And then after 10 years, your spouse has a keyboard of your buttons to push. And then after 20 years of marriage, I've heard your wife has an orchestra of every button to hit you in every situation or hypothetically, the husbands can push every button of their wife, overcook the eggs on purpose. Your wife makes you do the dishes so you break the plate, hypothetically. <laughs> hypothetically. <laughs> Anger. The amygdala releases catecholamines. Catecholamines cause epinephrine and norepinephrine to surge through your body. I once got stung in the eyeball by a bee. They gave me Benadryl because my face was closing. And then after the Benadryl, which was a downer, they stabbed me with an EpiPen. So my heart was beating at the speed of light. My eye was shutting and opening at the same time. My whole body was confused. Epinephrine makes you ramp up. Right now, I'm on two cups of coffee and a low-carb monster. I am epinephrine. When anger comes, the amygdala says, Shoot out catecholamines. Shoot out epinephrine and norepinephrine. We're going to get this guy's blood pressure through the sky, which is why some people turn beet red when they get angry. And here's what happens. And this, I'm only telling you this for the science nerds. At this point, your, your adrenaline is going so high and the blood is moving so fast in your brain, the part of your brain that's useful, the frontal cortex says, nah, I'm going to take a break. And then we do whatever it is. If it's on the road, you wave. If it's your spouse, you lash. Or maybe you're not a lasher. Maybe you're a suppressor. And here's what, I'm, I mean, I read so many articles from psychology today. I was reading psychological studies on anger. Like, okay, how do you deal with it? How do you deal with it? And I need this because I've tried everything. And I promise you, there is no yoga pose for a six foot six man that will release tension. I just get angry because stinking tree hug thing is not for me. And then I breathe. They say breathe. They say visualize blue calm air going in. Visualize red hot air going out. So I'm like, am I a dragon? 
And then they're like, relax your body. And it's like this one article knew me. Start, and then the step two, relax your body. And I'm like relaxing, and it's like unclench your fists. Oh, lower your shoulders. Oh, slouch a little bit. Thank the Lord. So then I'm just breathing, slouched over, and just enraged. And then it says, go journal about it. Yes, let me journal about it. FYI, don't journal when you're angry with fountain pens. Okay? Be angry and do not sin, which means, I need you to hear this, it is possible to be angry and not sin, which also means if you are angry, you should probably find a way to deal with it and maybe for you, breathing gets you partway there. I am a mouth breather. I start snoring before I fall asleep. So breathing is not a thing for me all the time. The yoga is not a thing for me. Stretching, working out, not a thing for me. So I, I said, okay, God, the world says either vent it out or, or deal with it, self-control. Let it go, stuff it down. When I let it go, you don't want that version of me. There are two people in this room that have seen me let it go. And I promise you, my mother and my wife are like, keep it in. But if I keep it in, here's what happens to me. It's like if you took the Hulk and you said, stay in that little body. And I know you're looking at me and you're thinking, yeah, that guy's huge and strong. He could destroy things. Don't let it out. I know you see this up here. But when I stuff it down and I just, just keep it, I can self-control anything. I mean, I, I, I can fast. I can do all these crazy things. I'm, I'm, I can regiment my life. A checkbox me to death. If I say, okay, anger, control it, reel it in. What happens is this. this. The anger existed. I'm not sinning externally. Now I'm sinning internally. Now I'm not actually dealing with the anger. I might say things like, ah, just let it go. But do I? Do you? I'll just, I'll just forgive him. I don't need to deal with it. That's super unhealthy if you're newlyweds, by the way. Like sweeping things under the rug. Eventually that rug is lumpy and turns into a volcano. So what do we do? How do we be angry and not sin? How do we not sit down and say, hey, devil, I've got an opportunity for you. Step on in. I'm just going to be angry and let it kill me. This is where I think we've got to really think about some things critically. This is why it's so hard because the amygdala is like, Norepinephrine, blood pressure shooting up, your eyes, your head, your face is red like it's been tomato, and your prefrontal cortex just took a five-minute break. This is where you got to bring it back in and say, okay, I'm getting angry. And one of the favorite things, I love this. This is um, from Martin Luther King, the, the civil rights activist. He has these principles of nonviolence. He says, nonviolence is being aggressive toward problems, not persons. Man, do I ever need that. Now, here's the problem with anger. We tend to think that anger is the issue. But anger is actually the symptom of the real issue. Anger arises when something is either scaring us or confronting us and taking away whatever it is. Our comfort, our control, our sense of authority, our sense of security. When something threatens those, anger is the response. So we're going to hypothetical. Let's say hypothetically, there are people that love football. There are people that can't wait for football to start. And hypothetically, one of them is a male who answers emails and works and meets with people. And he gets home and it's Monday night and the greatest team in the country is playing the Pittsburgh Steelers. And they're playing the worst team in the NFL, the Cincinnati Bengals. And it's a rivalry for those of you who don't know football. And he sits down and he's worked and he's tired. And he's like, I just want my popcorn. I just want my beer, not light beer, that's sinful, only dark beer. Um, and I just want one like a, a pork chop. And then football's coming on. Da -na 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 -na, da -na 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 -na. And then all of a sudden, hypothetically, this person has kids and they are sinners. <laughs> and they do what kids do they start fighting and yelling and bickering. And then one of them steals a pack of cookies, and the other one punches one. And before you know it, kids are bleeding, and I just want to drink my beer, eat my pork chop, and watch football. I mean, hypothetically, there's a guy who wants to just... 
So I lash out. Stop! What are you doing? Rawr! And I know I joke about like being big. I'm not big like this way. But as a human being, I'm, I'm large. And I terrify my kids. And I've just come to realize recently that my lashing out is this. My anger. I lash it out. I don't stuff it. I'm lashing. So I started to think, why am I doing this? Here's what I'm doing. I'm elevating my desire to be comfortable. I'm elevating my desire to be God of my life in this time. The object of worship is this food and this thing. If you come into my worship service I'm having, I will not have any of you. So I will use my anger to regain control. I will use my anger to regain power, to stuff my children down so that I can go back to what I truly want, which now sounds so trite. I want my comfort to just watch the game and eat something. Now you may be thinking, well, that's not me. I've never done that. Here, here's the thing with anger. It sneaks in. And instead of saying, I'm angry, this is a problem, we've got to say, why am I angry? Anger is coming because you've lost control of something. So you, here we talk about the sin beneath the sin. We also call it idols. Idols are not gold statues that you're worshiping in your closet. Idols are anything that you look to and live for to give you a sense of security, to give you worth and value and purpose. This could be a job. This could be your kids. This could be your spouse. This could be money. This could be fame, whatever. Any of these things could be your idols. When you're driving down the road, someone cuts you off. You were saying, this is my road. This is, I am the best. I know how to drive and no one else in Florida does. Somebody cut off your idol, which is why you waved. Because your comfort was interrupted. If we don't get to that part, we will be angry and sin. The reason that Paul says don't let the sun go down on it, because you've got to deal with it. If you just lash out and become a lasher, your kids will be scared of you. Your coworkers, friends, spouse will be terrified of you. If you become a stuffer, you'll build down like a Vesuvius. That's a volcano. And you'll erupt one day. Or you'll be so good at stuffing it down that you'll get sealed off at the top of your volcano and the lava will just burn you from the inside out. Instead, be angry and say, okay, I'm angry. And this is where it's hard because it requires reasoning. I'm not just going to lash and hurt somebody. I'm not going to let my anger burn people. I'm not going to let my anger burn my inside. I'm going to find out what is it, why am I angry? What did I just lose control of? What did I really want? Because guess what? Guess what's more important than Monday Night Football? The fact that my kids are growing up at the speed of light. The fact that my wife and I are celebrating 10 years of marriage next month. I don't know what happened. It's like we got married, someone knocked me out, and I woke up with three kids and a wife that still likes me. It's just flying. So then I think, okay, Pittsburgh Steelers. I'm desiring something about them so much that when my kids get in the way of that, I'm letting my idolatry, my desire for comfort, peace, and seclusion, because I want this to overshadow the fact that when my kids are born, they've only got like 938 weeks that I get to spend with them before they graduate and start voting. And at my age now, at the age my kids are at, nine years old, he's halfway there. He's going to be halfway through my parenting time with him. I'm going down to 450 weeks left with that guy. We made it through summer somehow. I have no idea how summer went this fast. All of a sudden I realized, my goodness, I worked an awful lot this summer. I should have gone to the beach more. I should have done this more because I had these functioning things. Got to do, got to do, got to do. And sometimes I just want to work because it's peaceful. You can't hold that against me later, babe. But sometimes I'm like, I just got to work because if I don't, my kids are going to be crawling and pestering. And but then I got to ask myself, what's my idol? What am I living for? Because then anger will come up. Some of you already know. Pastor Ryan, I'm angry. I'm a lasher-outer. How do I deal with it? If you're a lasher-outer, it's going to be the hardest one to deal with because you've got to reactivate the front side of your brain while your adrenaline's screaming to go 70 miles an hour. And you've got to say, why am I angry? 
the what's and the why's, you've got to ask yourself, what am I defending? What am I attacking? Why am I defending it? Why am I attacking it? The what's and the why's. That will dig down to the sin beneath the sin. Jesus got angry, and he never sinned. In Mark 3, it said when he was going to heal the man with the lame hand, Jesus looked around at the religious people, and it says in the Bible, he looked around at them with anger. Now here's the thing. I don't recommend you try on righteous anger. It is a hard sin to manage. It's one of those snowball effect sins. Once you get comfortable with anger, you just get used to it. And you, maybe you live with a 20% anger and everyone around you knows it. Maybe you're a 50 percenter, and on any given moment, 50-50 shot, you'll snap. Once that momentum is going, unless you're dealing with it, anger will build and build and build. Now, we can say, well, Jesus was angry and he didn't sin. I tend to just say, if you got angry, 99% of the time, I'm mostly sure you sinned, and I sinned. But here's the thing. We don't just vent it and lash it. We don't stuff it in. We need to do something with our anger. We need to, what the Bible calls, repent, change our false beliefs. So we say, God, I've been living for my own peace and comfort. That's been my God. I'm going to drop that off here, and I'm going to take you, my new God. This is what the Bible calls repenting. You change your mind. You get rid of false beliefs and accept beliefs we call faith in Jesus, that he now gives us his being and person around us and in us and through us. So now we're going to back all the way up. Put away falsehood and lies and exaggeration. Every sin that we do, every single one, is exchanging the truth about God for a lie. That's Romans 1. When you come to Jesus, you re-exchange the, tr the lies about God for truths. You can be angry and not sin. By taking the thing that you're truly living for that made you get angry, and you trade that in at the cross, and you say, I'm going to take Jesus in. And you're still going to struggle with it, but at least now you have a process. I'm going to take this here. I don't need this comfort because I have Christ to comfort me. I don't need this control because God is in control. I don't need to be this OCD because God has taken care of every detail. You can leave those things there and pick up the other things, the positive sides of Christ at the cross. Then you, you keep going through this passage. It just gets crazier and crazier. Don't steal. Now, this one's pretty self-explanatory. But he doesn't say just don't steal. He says work so that you can give. Some of you have a giving problem. You just don't like to give because your security is in how much money you have around you or how much stuff you have accumulated. I promise you, if your joy is dwindling, if your faith is like you can't hit that next gear, you're just pedaling and pedaling, try giving. I know it's hard. I'm just going to throw it out there because the wallet string is the last one that God cuts generally in our culture. We'll give God everything under the sun, but God, don't touch my money. I get it. It's hard. But if you want to, try to give and see what happens in your soul. And then he says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. The old way of talking corrupts. It rusts. It tears down. Jesus went to the grave to overcome uh, physical and overcame physical corruption so we would overcome spiritual corruption. Could you imagine if none of us said anything corrupting but only built others up? Wow. I would have hardly anything to say to some of you. How would that change a marriage? If your words only built up. If before you spewed the goo, you said, is this going to build or tear? Is this going to lift down or crush down? Lift up or crush down? What would your marriage, just your marriage, what would your parenting look like? If you begin to trade in your idols and take Christ in, because this is what the Bible's saying, put off the old self. This is the old way of living, and now here's the new way. Put those things off, put the new in. What if you tried for one hour to use words to only build up. One hour today. If you just said, one hour, I'm going to be relentless. I'm going to write it on my glasses with an Expo marker. Love. What if when you went home today, your kids, they somehow magically knew what this sermon was about. So they light something on fire in the backyard and start cussing you out. 
And what if you just said, I'm going to be angry. I'm not going to sin. This is dangerous though, so I'm going to deal with this. And here's what I had to do with my kid recently. I had to sit down, and I've done this multiple times. And I say, okay, buddy, I got so angry, and that was so wrong of me. I should not have yelled that much. I should not have picked you up this way. That was wrong. I'm sorry. I, I, was, I was loving something else more that was not as important. But we have a real problem here, son. What you're doing is still damaging your life. And I don't want you to do that. What you're doing is going to affect your friendships and your school, and I don't want you to live that way. I don't want you to have to, to do this thing, whatever it is, the sin or the anger, the lie that's in him. So, so I can confess my sin. I confess that I use words wrongly and anger wrongly, and then I have to sit with him and say, but we still have a real problem. And it's in those moments that parenting actually works. We can't scare our kids or our spouse into obedience for long. You try to domineer your, your husband or wife or your friends or your coworkers, eventually people just retreat from you. You domineer your kids, eventually they turn 18 and flee from you. But what we can do is model this idea of, okay, that was old self, that was not Jesus me, I'm taking that back off. And then we tell our kids or spouse, whoever it is about that, I've lived this way, this is not Christ's way. So I'm going to take it and I'm going to dump it at the cross. Here's what I've really been wanting to do. I've really been acting like God, thinking I'm in control, but I'm not, son. God's in control. Can we pray together now and ask God to forgive us both? Those conversations go way better than the other kind that I have. Ah, uh, get in your room. No treats for 17 lifetimes. I'm still serving multiple life sentences of groundation right now. Thanks, Mom. So, so what do we do? How do we do this? How do we be kind? It's not going to happen simply by self-control. Self-control will get us a lot of these, but not all of them. Because religious people do this. They stop stealing. They stop lying. They might be kind. But things like anger, that's an emotive response. Until we learn how to bring the idols to the cross and exchange them for Jesus, those emotive responses will plague our lives. A couple more things. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you know when your mom tells you the worst thing she could possibly tell you? I'm not angry, son. I'm... Oh, <laughs> my goodness. I was such a sinner. I was like, good. Job done. Evil. I needed Jesus. When the pastor was trying to convince me that I was a sinner, I was like, skip Romans 3. I got that. I get it. It's only church kids that don't realize they're sinners because I was a rascal. But then in Christ, it says we can grieve the Holy Spirit. I've grieved my mother. I've grieved my wife. I've grieved some of you. When we put on the old self, we grieve the presence of God in us. The very presence of God is within our limbs and soul and being. And when we say, Thanks for all the new things to wear, the kindness, the tenderness, the forgiveness, the peace. Thanks for a way to get out of anger in a healthy manner. But I'm going to choose to be angry. I'm going to choose to tear down. It says we're putting on the old garments, the old life. And the Holy Spirit says, no, no, please, stop. And here's an interesting way it phrases that verse. Because you were sealed. Past tense. You, pe you were saved by Jesus, filled with the Spirit of Jesus for the day of redemption. So God did this amazing work. He gave you infinite riches in Christ in power with his Spirit to do things that are incredibly beyond what we can imagine or accomplish on our own. And with that we say, thanks, but I'm going to just trade it in to play in the mud. And the Spirit's like, just get up. Yeah, I give, I've given you so much more. I've already sealed you. Be who you are. Stop, stop trying to be who you were. But some of us love the power that the old life afforded us. Some of us love the ability to control others and manipulate others with the old ways. So we just hang out over here, lashing, stuffing, tearing down, anger, 
no kindness, no tenderness, no forgiveness. We're just playing demigod on our little island of sadness. And those of you who are there, you know it. You go to sleep at night and there's a poison surging through you and you know it. You get angry and your kids run and you know it. You raise your voice and your spouse just shuts down and you know it. This is what happens when we return to the old self over and over and over again. Be who you were saved to be, church. You have a new way of living, a new way to be human, where bitterness, which is stuffing anger down in you and letting it fester, can finally be dealt with. Where wrath, the word tumas means white hot, can finally be quenched with God's love. And then it says things that every parent has taught their kids that I am aware of. Be kind. Be tender. Forgive. And here's the kicker. Just as Christ forgave you. When you're forgetting how much Christ has forgiven you, you will be angry. When you're forgetting how much Christ has lifted you up, your words will tear people down. When you're forgetting that Christ has given you everything, you'll try to take other things from other people to fill the gap of your soul. It always starts. It's always about. It's always going to be looking to the cross of Christ to say he is all that I need. He is enough for me. He is in control. I am not in control. He has forgiven me even though I don't deserve to be forgiven. And that ought to fuel the way that we live outwardly. Now, as someone who's had their worst angry year in 18 years, since 1999, um, it's not easy. It's not easy when the blood pressure is soaring to be rational enough to think, stop, what's my sin beneath the sin? It's this. I must therefore replace it with this, and Jesus will come and do this. No. Yeah. Uh, lashing out. Oak trees win fist fights. Some of you know that. I know that. Friggin' oak trees. Stuffing it down. Like, and this may be a thing, like some of you that are slightly ahead of the age curve for me can help a brother out, but I'm in my mid, late 30s. My cholesterol's high, obvious, obviously, all the bacon I consume. But, um, this year, just no amount of Tums could deal with the heartburn. And I thought, I must be eating something wrong. And then as I'm reading all the studies on the physiological effects of anger, I'm like, oh, I'm literally killing myself with anger. <laughs> like literally, my mental anger and some of yours is killing you. Your blood pressure is higher. Your vision is blurrier. Your heart is is spewing up, getting acid, latching onto your esophagus because of anger. So man, I was like, God, I've got I've to deal with this in a real way. Because I tried everything. I stretched, I breathed, I relaxed, I slunched, I slouched, I journaled, I inked, I re-raged, I restarted. And here's what I finally had to come to the conclusion of. Things that I know in my head, that we, many of us know, that we don't let get to our heart. We know God's in control. When we're having anxiety, worry, fear, and anger, we know it in our head, but it's not actually changing our heart. In our heart, we believe, no, I'm in control of my world. None of us say this out loud, but we all do it every day. Every time you yell at somebody, it's because you were God for a split second, and your mouth let them know that. So to deal with this, I knew, I'm not God, you're God. So I started reading verses about God's power. Verses about God's love. Verses about 
God's anger because I want to see how God got angry. Verses about anger in the Bible because I want to see if I'm the only crazy person that yells up at God. Because if I'm angry, he already knows it, so there's no sense in hiding it. But man, I think today I'm finally going to make like Elsa. That's right, Disney fans. I'm leaving it over there. I'm going to let it go. And then, uh, <laughs> and then hopefully Jesus is going to make like Maui from Moana and say, you're welcome. <laughs> I'd just like to see who's super into Disney, you sinners. <laughs> no, Disney's okay. <laughs> the Game of Thrones is a different question. Send me angry emails later. Because here's the thing. Do I, want to, do I want to put on the new self? What does the new self look like? These are only a handful of things. Holiness is vast. I don't just want things out of my life that are sin. I want things out of my life that slow me down. And if you want to come with me, let's cast off the weights. And I don't need to be legalistic about it. Go ahead. I'm sure many of you can watch things that I can't watch and not sin. I can do things that you can't do and not sin probably. But I want to run. Because I'm running to see Jesus. The one thing that my kids have right is that they joke and we talk about death all the time in my house. It was an adjustment period for my mother-in-law because I'd be like, she's on her birthday, I'm like, high five, almost there. I learned that people that are older don't like that. <laughs> However, here's what she says now. You, she's right here, you can verify it. She says, thank you. For, for getting me to rethink and refocus. Thank you. Because the time is nigh. And too many of us are pandering about with these little sins, with a little anger, with a little th thievery, with a little IRS cheating. It's back to school weekend. It's tax-free weekend. A bunch of parents going to the wild, buying everything for themselves. Back to school for my kids. I mean, I don't know if that's the rule or not. I don't know how that works in Florida. I think it's cool. I'm a clergy. They can't, you can't get me now, government, you know. <laughs> so so what, are we, what are you going to do? Are you going to run with me? Or are you going to harbor these little things, the, the, the anger, the bitterness? Let's let these things go and run. Let's pray. God, I thank you. I thank you that you would change us, that you would love us, that you would come into our lives and cleanse us, that you would restore us, Lord, for those who are struggling in the grip of anger today, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would show them that you would get their brain working to find out what it is that they're living for, whether it's in a marriage or as a parent or at work or with relatives. God, break in and help us not just to lash out or stuff it down. Help us to find the source of our anger and bring it to you. God, because I can't do it on my own. No one here can do it on their own. God, there's so many marriages, there's so many parents, there's so many people that are either getting crushed by their own anger or crushed by another's. So help us. Help us all. We cannot do this without you. So help us to overcome. Help us to have a, a momentary flash of rationality in the midst of our emotional response. Help us. And help us to treat every sin through this grid. To not just say the good or the bad, do's and don'ts, but to bring all of our idols, the sin beneath the sin, to the cross of Christ where we can be done with it and become and be who you've made us and saved us to be. In Jesus' name, amen.